dear students we are back with our class we have been discussing about the design of facilities and within that we started our discussion on parking facilities already we have discussed about the off street parking the on street parking the supply norms the parking supply and the accumulation in today's interaction we are going to start again with the parking facilities and we'll look at whatever the things which are being left that is in terms of few of the parking characteristics and the suppressed parking demand and how to tackle that and how to find out at what is the additional requirement so as to be provided in an area to satisfy the demand and then the another topic which we are going to talk today is bus bays so let us start our discussion with parking characteristics now apart from the characteristics which we have discussed like parking accumulation or the parking supply the another one is the parking index now this parking index basically defines that in a particular area whatever are the total number of spaces which have been provided for the parking of vehicle so how much is the utilization of these spaces say if we have provided 100 parking spaces in this area and at any point of a time at the maximum only 80 spaces have been utilized then that means it is going to have a parking index of 80% so it's a measure which indicates the usage of the parking spaces and it is expressed as a percentage of the theoretically available spaces which are occupied by the parked vehicles during a specified time period or a duration say we are talking about that what is the index from 8 am to 8:30 am or what is the index in the uh, say the afternoon from 12 noon to say 1 pm or from 1 pm to 2 pm or in the evening so whatever are the requirements on the basis of that we can identify we can find it out and obviously this is going to be different for different locations it is going to be different across the time periods in a day but what we are going to understand here is that if at the maximum 80% is the utilization then we have additional 20% spaces available in that parking area which can be used during the occasional demands which may happen due to some specific event taking place in the adjoining area but if it comes out to be 100% then that means there is a issue now there is no space available and we have to look for some additional spaces so as to take care of those occasional demands and if the enforcement is not there then we may found that it is even more than 100% so if it is 120% it means 20% extra vehicles are there in the area and this is obviously going to create a parking congestion in that area and this needs to be uh, rectified we have to enforce the parking regulations whatever has been there in that area and then for those 20% we have to find out the additional spaces and if these additional spaces are not possible then we have to see the parking policies how this can be tackled the another thing is a parking turnover now this parking turnover is basically defining the rate of usage so we have the parking place here so this is a parking location a vehicle comes and stands here and then it goes out and the another vehicle comes and then this keeps going on throughout the day it means that whatever these vehicles are coming here for they are all such activities which are not going to take much of the time and therefore the same space is being utilized by n number of vehicles in the total time period say we are talking from 8 am to 8 pm so how many vehicles have come and they have uses this particular space so this rate of use of parking spaces and this is obtained by dividing the parking volume by the number of parking spaces for a specified time period obviously if this value is more that means it is showing more of an activity in this area and probably it is also going to give an idea the status of economic activities in that particular area so it is going to be quite high then only this turnover is going to be more but if there is a vehicle which comes here and remains in parking throughout the day maybe it is a vehicle of a person who is here in this area for a work reason or he is an employee or employer so in all of those cases of it remains there for say 8 hour then this space has been utilized by one vehicle in 8 hour time period 
so it is a very very low turnover even though there is an economic activity which is happening but the opportunity for the other vehicles if it is not there then they will start reducing coming to this area and this is why this also needs to be looked at the parking turnover of an area of that particular lot also needs to be taken into consideration the next is the parking duration so any vehicle which comes in an area and parks at a location it may happen that this vehicle is being parked for only say 15 minutes or it has been parked for 2 hours or say it has been parked for 3 or 30 minutes now all of these things they are dependent on that what is that activity in which this vehicle owner or the person who is traveling in this vehicle is involved say if it is a 15 minute we can assume that maybe it is sort of say banking we are not much of the time is to be given two hour may be like we may assume it's maybe a say shopping three or 30 minutes say a person has gone to see a movie in a shopping area in a shop in a big plaza so it's taking more time so two hours movie with some other activities three or 30 minutes comes out to be for that so whatever such values are there this vehicle remains there for this much time period and then there are different vehicles which are going to stay for different time periods so on the basis of that we need to know that what is going to be the average parking duration and this average parking duration can be by vehicle it can be by location it can be by the trip purpose or likewise so this is an important aspect which needs to be looked at because uh, if we are trying to see that what is the demand which will be there in a, any specified time period then we also need to look at that what are the parking durations so as i said that these are going to be dependent on different factors like activities or even size of the city, the purpose of uh, the trip, etc. On the basis of these values which are being defined, say as I have given here as an example 15 minutes to 3 or 30 minutes, we can define these parking durations as long term and short term. In most of the cases, we may find that from 2 to 3 hours we consider. So, if this is there, then it is a say a short term. So, it is less than or equals to, but if it is more than this, then we consider this as a long term parking. And this amount, number of vehicles which are there, which are being parked for long term, these becomes the candidate values for of the street parking. So, they needs to be shifted to that and <coughs> this will going to help us in increasing the turnover of uh, those spaces which otherwise are going to become available now. So, that is uh, another aspect. So, once you do this type of an analysis, you may have an idea that what type of policies can be done, can be enforced and how the different type of vehicles or different type of vehicle users can be segregated and taken from one location to another location. Now, this is an example where with respect to the population groups which are less than 50,000 to more than 5 lakhs for different reasons of travel say shopping and business work or others or as combined all purpose conditions the durations have been specified and what we can see is that even in the case of uh, any one category say shopping or business as the population size is increasing what we found is that this time period is also increasing the vehicle which is being left in parking it is increasing the reason is that it is also creating an impact in terms of uh, the increase in the size of the city because the population size is increasing unless and until it is being designed in such a manner there is a vertical changeover and because of that there is a high density per unit area so if that is not there then you may found that the extent is increasing and because that extent is increasing then people will like to accumulate the works and when they come to this shopping area or a business area they will try to do lot many activities together and that's why the time period for which a vehicle is going to be there in a parking is higher and the same is the condition when you look at uh, the work scenario also where what we can see here is uh, roughly around for 4 hours the vehicles have been there if 
the population is up to 2.5 lakhs. So, we are talking about say the small size of the cities versus the large size of the cities, where the values are changing and it is coming to an average of say something like 5.2 hours if the population is more than 5 lakhs. And similarly, in other cases also the inferences can be drawn. Now, when we talked about this duration and we also talked about accumulation, then that means all of these things together they are coming into the form of a demand. So, for a particular specific area, some parking demand is going to be there and this parking demand is to be satisfied by way of the spaces being made available that means the parking supply. But then the parking supply cannot be any infinite value, it is a finite value you may have 100 spaces, 50 spaces, 200 spaces depending on the size of the area in which they have been provided. So, we have to look at this demand versus supply. Now, so far the demand is less than supply, the conditions are going to be good. It means whosoever is coming in that area, they are going to get a location where the vehicle can be parked. But the problem occurs when the demand becomes more than the supply, it means when you are coming to that location and already all of the spaces are being filled, you have to start searching in the area and then you come out with the conclusion that there is no space left and you have to go to some other location so as to find out the parking space and do your activity. But in that case, it may happen that that space is quite far away from the location where the desired activity is to be done. Now, this thing if it is happening, it is going to create problems to the vehicle drivers or parkers also as well as on the network there is going to be a congestion because these vehicles will keep moving around in a uh, quite slower speeds while looking for the spaces and then the capacity is going to be affected. Now, when we are looking at this aspect that we had 100 spaces and they all are full and now the next vehicle comes and tries to look for a space, but then there is no space. So, there are n number of vehicles which comes in a time period and they found that there is no space available and therefore, they have to move forward and look for some other location. Now, these n number of vehicles which were desiring to park at this location actually that is what is the suppressed parking demand. So, the number of parkers who are denied entry or the parking spaces they represent the suppressed parking demand. Now, when you are looking at these parkers, again these parkers are going to be there for different time durations. They may be there for say only 10 minutes or 15 minutes or they may be there for even 3 hours. So, that means they are going to be short term or long term parkers and then all of these vehicles which we are talking as in they are also going to be different type of vehicles. So, what we require is that we require the spaces which can be either categorized by short term and long term parking spaces or can also be categorized by the type of vehicle which is going to be there in that parking area. So, when we are trying to look at this, then this can be calculated or the suppressed parking demand that can be calculated by way of considering this variable that is space hours. That one space which is there, if a vehicle comes and gets parked, now on that space for what is the duration for which this vehicle is being parked. So, one space is being occupied say for 30 minutes or one space is being occupied for 180 minutes, what exactly is that? And similarly, this is going to happen to rest of the other spaces too. So, the space R of demand is being calculated and this space R of demand can be P into D, where P is the total number of parkers who are desiring to park in an area, but they could not get an opportunity and D is the average parking duration for those parkers. So, based on this now you are going to get a value and if you want to go to a more disaggregate condition, then we can look at in terms of this formula where it is a summation of n i into t i where i changes from 1 to n. Now, what is n i and t i? Here i is the category of the vehicle, 
out of n categories or it can be in other form also whatever the categorization we want to make. We can say that we are talking uh, again some sort of an aggregation so long term short term or by type of vehicles by type of another thing. And when you are looking at n then n and uh, t they are basically the number of vehicles and the duration. So, uh, one category what number of vehicles are there for what duration they are being parked similarly they are going to be different such categories and when we take the multiplication and summations of that is going to be the space r. Now, when we are considering this the another thing which we have to keep it in mind is that whatever is the parking index which is there where we said that if 100 percent spaces are being occupied then it is a 100 percent parking index. But we should not aim to have that what we should aim is that the parking index optimally should be around at the maximum 85 percent. That means, it allows you 15 percent spaces which takes care of the occasional demand which may happen in that area. So, if we go by this particular uh, aspect then the parking efficiency is another factor which can be considered while trying to come up with the additional spaces which needs to be required to be provided in an area so that the suppressed parking demand can be satisfied. So, in that direction the guideline is being given here what it says is the for curb parking during the highest demand it can be considered ranging between 78 percent to 96 percent with an average of 90 percent. And for surface loads and garages it can be considered between 75 percent to 92 percent whereas for garages it can be taken as 80 percent and for surface loads it can be taken as 85 percent. So, these are the values which are there and can be used so as to come up with the additional spaces. Let us look at an example here. There is a parking garage. So, it is being provided in a CBD area. What it says is that 20 percent of those wishing to park are turned back every day during the open hour of 8 am to 6 pm. So, when we look at this it means this is uh, 10 hour duration total in which the survey has been done and there are 20 percent who are being sent back. And when the analysis was done for the data what it was observed is that uh, those who are who parked in those 60 percent were the commuters and they were having the average parking duration of 9 hours and the remaining were shoppers who were having the average parking duration of 2 hours. And a 20 percent who could not park for them also the analysis is being done and it has been found that they are also commuters and uh, shoppers in that area also. So, if 20 percent of those are commuters and 80 percent are shoppers here and for them the durations are already known. So, what we have to find out we have to find out the additional spaces which are required to satisfy this and uh, there should not be a suppressed demand and the total spaces which are available in that parking area are 200. So, that means 200 vehicles could be parked, but then 20 percent were not being parked. So, whatever the total was there of that total only 80 percent has been parked that is what we need to understand. So, if we look at that then let us see here the very first thing is that the vehicles which have been parked if we convert them into an space R then it is a simple thing that 200 vehicles total are there out of which 60 percent are cars with the uh, uh, commuters and commuters they are there for 9 hours and they are 40 percent who are there for 2 hours. So, that comes out to be 1240 space hours. Now, when we talk about those additional requirements then 80 percent have been able to park and if we go with that then what we found is that the requirement was for 250 against which 200 has been there. So, there are 50 vehicles which have been turned away from this area. Now, if we co uh, convert that into an a space hour then 20 percent are there for 9 hours and 80 percent are there for 2 hours. So, which comes out to be 170 space r. Now, for this 170 space r we have to see that how it gets culminated into the number of spaces. So, this is what we say the number of additional space hours occupied or required that is going to be efficiency factor into time duration into the additional spaces and this is how it gets satisfied. So, the number of additional space hours which have been observed are or calculated are 170. Now, 
efficiency factor for garages is say 0.8, the time duration for which the data has been taken is 10 hours and we need to have n spaces. So, if we use this what we get is the 22 additional spaces are required so as to satisfy the requirement of those 50 vehicles which have been turned away during the time period of 10 hours. So, this is how the suppressed parking demand can be calculated. Now, let us change our topic and let us move to the next topic which is bus base. Now, when we look at these two photographs being given here, what you found is that there is a main carriageway. It has been separated out by way of uh, uh, the raised structure or a median and then there is a dedicated bus lane being provided. On this side, there is a curb on which the passengers can get down from this bus or can board the bus and there is a shelter being provided here so that these all passengers they get into it and then get into the bus or come out of the bus in this shelter and that is how it is being utilized. At the same time there is also a carriageway at the back of it and that is why it is being protected on the other side. In this another case what we can see is that there is a main carriageway, the three lanes are there and there may be a bus which is coming from this direction but when it has to stop on this lane, then the stopping of a bus here is going to create a big queue at the back of it. And what we have done is we have done a flaring here and by way of this flaring this bus comes here and then it is going to be parked at this location and if there are two buses and this is big enough then the two buses can be parked here they can stand here and then the passengers can get in and out of the bus. So, this is what is a bus bay we are basically talking about. Now, why the bus bays are required and where they are being justified or not justified is what we are looking here. It says that the bus bays has to be looked at based on the traffic volume. So, you have uh, the lanes, the traffic is moving in both the directions. What is this volume? which is there. It is quite high and you stop the bus on the carriageway, then as I said the queues are going to be formed and this is going to create a problem to the overall system. There will be delays to many of the people. The frequency of buses, every 5 minutes there is a bus because if you have a bus shelter here, there is always a possibility that there are number of routes for which the bus comes and stops at this particular location. So, it may happen that every 5 minutes there is going to be a bus at this location and if we are parking the bus in this form, then this is going to create a issue. So, if we have a situation where we have just taken it back, a setback is there with respect to the main carriageway then if the bus stops here, it is not going to create any problem to the through traffic. Duration of the uh, buses and there is stopping. So, if the bus comes there, it stops there for maybe only half a minute or it stops there for 2 minutes or more than that. What is the demand in this area? How many activities are there which are culminating in the ridership to the buses? So, all of these things they are going to together decide that whether the location requires a bus bay or we can go ahead with a single condition where a, a, a bus is stop on the carriageway can be provided. Now, when we look at the national highways and state highways, then the provision of the bus bay is justified if there is a volume of traffic such that the true traffic movements are going to be disturbed because of the stopping of the buses on the carriageway or the buses are going to stop for a considerable time periods or the roadway is congested or it passes through a congested locality or it is having high local traffic. In all of such conditions, if that NH and SH is there, then we should go for a bus bay design. But usually in the case of ODRs and the case of VRs, the bus bays are not provided and that is again we can go back for the reasons which have been written here at the top and we have discussed about it. 
Now, what can be the criteria with respect to the safety and the minimum interference with the through traffic when we are talking about the location of a bus B? So, very first thing is it should be away from the bridges, it should be away from the important structures because there are going to be many in and out movements. Say it is a recreational area or a, a location of a high attraction, then the pedestrian activity is going to be high. So, if that is a situation and we have provided a bus stop very near to that, then this is going to create a problem to those movements specifically with respect to the pedestrians and that is the reason why that we should go away from this location. The same is in the case of bridges, on the bridges we should not do it because bridge is already having a restricted uh, carriageway. So, we should not go for it. Even in the case of the embankments which are quite high, say if they are more than 3 meters high then the bus bays are not provided on that. We should try to come to the normal flat surface at leveled surface as soon as that path comes down or on the horizontal or the summit curves because of the curvature and the visibility requirements at that one. Uh, we should again uh, not think of providing the bus bays at these locations. And when we are talking about these bus bays with respect to any of the locations, say we say that uh, there is an intersection like this and we are going to provide a bus bay here. So, why this bus bay is to be provided here is that if the bus stops here, then what is this visibility which is available as well as the vehicle which is coming from the back, whether they are going to get the clear visibility of the vehicles which are coming from the other side. So, this side triangle is going to be obstructed. So, we have to look at this visibility requirements also and when we talked about these visibility requirements side distances, we have discussed that SSD is the minimum value which has to be ensured in whatever condition road is working or it is traffic is moving on that particular route. Now, the minimum distance between the tangent point of the intersection and the start or end of the lay-by here for the buses, they have been defined and it says that it should be 300 meters in the case of uh, rural highways. So, that means this is what we are saying that this is going to be 300 meters and if it is being provided here then the same is uh, true for this side. 60 meters on the minor uh, uh, rural highway intersections or in the case of urban roads it should be 75 meters from the intersection on either of the side, but it is always better that if it is provided on the farther side that means if uh, this is an intersection, the traffic is moving like this, then it is better to have the bay on this side at 75 meter distance rather than on this side. Similarly, if it is a turning and if we have to provide it here, so then this can be again at this side. So, this ensures the turning movements are free and the visibilities are proper and then there is no problem to the smooth movement as well as the safety. Now, there are few other considerations which can be considered like in the case of hilly areas, the minimum visibility shall not be less than 50 meters and the bus bays because there are gradient problems, we should try to have them on flat gradients as well as on straight sections. If there are large number of buses which are turning right, then the bus bay should be located ahead of the intersection that is as we have discussed in the previous slide 2. If large number of buses transfer between routes, then a single composite bus stop shall be designed. So, it should not happen that we have provided a bus bay like this and then we say ok, now we are providing a bus bay here and then we are providing a bus bay here, no that is not the way. What we need to do is that we can have a composite bus bay like this, where now the facility is there for say n number of buses which can be stopped and the passengers can utilize the services. Separate bus stop shall be provided for each direction of travel. So, if you have a two way road, so then there is a B here, similarly there can be a B so as to tackle to the movements in two directions. Passengers shall embark on a safe curbside or island spaces, this means that whatever these spaces which have been designed here, where the pedestrians are going to or the passengers are going to uh, either from board or alighted. So, this curve side is raised 
and we have to raise it because otherwise that will going to be difficult for the passengers to get in or out of the buses. So, that level difference has to be maintained. Frequency of bus stops on busy streets shall be as low as possible, this is another point. Now, if you look at the UK practice in this area with respect to the location or the frequency of the bus base being provided, what it says is that no resident has to walk more than 400 meters from home to bus stop. So, this becomes one of the criteria. So, maximum distance is 400 meters. Similarly, on the other side also there is a 400 meters. So, we can say roughly around 800 meters is going to be the distance between the two say, bus stops. Majority of the residents have to walk not more than 200 meters. So, this is another criteria. When there are elderly or mobility impaired residents and the numbers are quite high of such people in a specific area, then that should be reduced to 100 meters. If there is a gradient on the road, though we have talked that as far as possible, we should provide these uh, bus stops or bus laybys uh, uh, on a flat uh, leveled surface uh, or a stretch. But if it is there, then the walk distance be reduced by 10 meters for every 1 meter rise or fall. So, whatever the values are being considered here, the gradient effect will be taken in that sense. Now, when we look at the layout, the layout is going to be dependent on various things like number of buses which are stopping at any time, period of halt, volume of traffic, number of passengers, we discussed about it. Few of the design attributes, let us go through that. Very first thing is if there is only one bus, then this straight portion has to be minimum 15 meters per bus. Then the lane which we are going to provide here, in which the bus will come and stop. So, it is minimum 3 meters, desirably 3.5 and 3.75 meters can be there if it is a part of a deacceleration lane. Then the flare is there, then this flare again has to be at certain rate. So, that can be 1 in 4 to 1 in 15 depending on whether from going from heavy traffic or light traffic conditions. So, this is another aspect. Curb section along the whole of uh, this transition has to be provided. So, whatever is uh, this system there. So, we are going to have a curved system here. Gradients, they can be within 1 in 8 to 1 in 16.67. Then the texture can be used here for this bus bay location, so that it uh, differentiates it with respect to the main carriageway. Then B may be separated from the main carriageway through pavement markings or medians. So, now this is the marking we are talking, but say if the traffic is quite high on this section and we have to separate them out, then there is a possibility of having the median. So, there is a main carriageway here and this is a bus layby. So, and when you have this median, then it is also going to have uh, the markings again, the chevron markings are also going to be there. So, this is an island and these are markings. So, this is how it will be done. Shoulders adjacent to the bay shall be paved to permit occasional parking of the vehicle. So, whatever these shoulders are being provided. So, this is how we are going to do it. So, this is a shoulder and these shoulders should be paved. So, we are providing it say 1.5 meter wide shoulder. So, if it is paved and the, if there is a requirement of parking of a vehicle, person is coming to drop or pick up. So, that is also feasible. Drainage also needs to be taken care of and whatever appropriate markings are there, they should be there as per the Indian Road Congress guidelines. So, we can see here that this is a, a design for a bus stop on carriageway. So, this is the curb side. So, bus stop is this one. So, it is being marked and how it is being marked is that as you can see that this is the lines which are being used. So, 100 mm uh, wide lines are there and these lines are uh, 1 meter long. So, this is 1 meter with a gap of 1 meter. So, that means this comes out to be minimum 3 meters in this form. And if we are going for 15 meters for one bus, then again the same thing is going to happen. So, this is 1 meter with a 1 meter gap and 1 meter, that is how 
the markings are going to be there continuously. And at the same time on this particular space, the bus stop is being written on the pavement surface. So, that defines that this is an area which is dedicated where the bus will come and stop. So, this is one way of doing it that can be done if the traffic is quite low. Now, here the case is being shown where uh, uh, you have a layout the heavy traffic is there and that is the reason why these uh, median has been provided and say this median depending on the traffic can be suppose 3 meters wide and this bay area the width is can be provided 7 meters. If it is 7 meters then it allows the two buses to just pass each other and uh, that is where if one bus stands here and in one bus again stands here. So, this can move forward if so required. So, that is where 7 meters can be talked. Now, on this side there is a bus shelter, then this is a ramp because this is a curved section and this is shoulder which is paved being provided. And then there is a bifurcation arrows defines that which traffic goes which way there are uh, chevron markings. So, what we found is that 15 meters per bus we are going to consider. So, that is where this L length is going to be there and apart from that now from this point to this point. So, this is 20 meters on this side and this is 10 meters on this side. Then the length being provided for the chevron which is there. So, this length is also considered or we can also have a distance being taken from here itself say it is 80 meters on this side and 40 meters on the other side. So, we can say that if this is 7 meters and this is 3 meters so 10 meters 10 meters means this comes out to be uh, 1 in 8 and 1 in 4 flare. Then they are going to be pedestrians. So, the pedestrian markings are being provided across the street. This is a yellow continuous line which says that no overtaking should be done in this passage from here to here. So, that much is the length being considered and this point is being taken with respect to again a sign. So, the sign is there which defines that there are going to be pedestrians ahead and there is a busway ahead. So, this is how the overall layout is going to be looked at. Similarly, we can see in the other case also this is for medium and light traffic and because of that the median is not being provided, but rest of the features remains the same. The only thing is now in this case we can go for a say the symmetrical design. So, it is 45 meters on either of these sides being taken along with the length of this with the shoulders as well as the shelter. This is a staggered condition we talked about the staggered condition. So, what it says that minimum distance between the two should be 20 meters and then the rest of the features again remains the same. So, we have uh, this length, we have the length of uh, the median and the, uh, the length of uh, the markings and then what we are providing is 80 and 40 meters and 15 meter is the distance from here for the sign which says that there are going to be the pedestrians ahead. Now, depending on whether there is a heavy traffic or not the island has to be taken care of and you can see that this can also change depending on that what are the restrictions, what is the speed with which the vehicles are moving accordingly we can make a change in these lengths also. This is a case for the hilly area where the uh, spaces are going to be a bit constrained. So, that is results in the distances which have been taken on either side of the bus stop which are again symmetrical but 22 meters only. And then uh, we have uh, these spaces being provided, but at the same time this yellow line will remain. So, that uh, uh, there is no undesired activity in the area which hampers the safety. Rest of the features again remains the same. This is a case for a urban road where the say the service road is there at the back and therefore, the uh, development if it is there in this area the pedestrians are going to move from that direction. So, the pedestrian a marking is being provided at the back side. This is the island and this island width is going to be dependent on the passengers who are there. So, it is minimum 1 meters for the minimum passengers 20, but for each increase of 25 passengers then it is increased by 0.5 uh, meters. 
So, being also given here and then this can be 4 meters wide here. We can see that this is again a symmetrical condition 30 to 32 meters on either side and a 7 meter main carriageway is being provided. And here we have uh, these markings which are there which defines that they are either in terms of the markings or in terms of the blocks so that the traffic is getting segregated just before reaching this location. Now, this is a case where the traffic is less and therefore, what you have is uh, you have provided this way a condition, but if suppose there are number of buses which are coming then what feature which you can see here is that this width of the bay is being increased from 4 meters to 7 meters. So, if there are 2 buses, 3 buses then we have to provide the uh, possibility of passing. And if there is a requirement then fencing can also be used here if the segregation is uh, to be maintained that is uh, another way of ensuring the safety. This is a layout which is being taken from the design manual of roads and bridges more or less similar things are there. We it also talks about a footpath at the back and that can be merged in the curved area and we will be discussing about it when we will take up the shelters. This is another design where the emergency lay-by is being talked about. The only thing is the emergency phone is being provided here and uh, that is uh, additional feature, but rest of the features are again same. So, we close here, we will be continuing our discussion on the bus shelters and truck lay-bys in the next interaction. Till then, thank you and bye.